Okay, it should be any second now. There we go. It is. <laughs> well, hey, I was also, you know, this corollary. Yeah, we're on, uh, Bruce, say hi, yeah. wave at us. I'm Baron Ron Heron, and it's stargazing time. Space freaks, let's join together on the Zoom screen. Got another whole hour ahead of us of unmitigated astrophysics as we kick off our 100 seconds episode of the SBAU Astro Hour. Started years ago, March 1st, believe it or not, uh, back in uh, 21, when we were all on the radio before that for the South Coast Longtime Astronomy and Telescope Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. I got to host it back then on the radio. Now, look, Mom, I'm vice president of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Got to host back then, and we're doing it again. We're on Zoom every Monday morning, live from our computer dens and wherever we hang out. And here's, before we meet the gang, my name's Ron, and I'll introduce you to the president, the outreach guy, and uh, one of our stalwart supporters. Different ways we calculate how far away objects are in space. We're going to find out. There's several ways. We've got a full snow moon out there in the western sky, unless it's nighttime, in which case it's the eastern sky. Or no, it's the other way around. No, it goes Anyway, how do you kill a nova? We'll talk about it. Hire a hitman, I guess. Where are the magnitude one twin stars, Castor and Pollux, these days? And Draco's just under the Little Dipper, getting wet. Star cluster M34 is in Perseus. Venus near Jupiter and Neptune up in the sky. And the Emerald Comet exit stage south. Let's meet the boy wonders, the guys in charge for five years, our beloved president, Jerry Wilson. How you doing, sir? Good morning. Good job, Friday night. His wife is Pat Forgy, and she's a supporter and member of the club. We got a great outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland, who at one time was doing over 200 a year, 200 outreach events, and that means more than two a week. I don't know how you did that. You're not up to that now, are you? It's Chuck? all. It's not all just me. It's it's other people in the club. No, we were back up to, uh, I think, low 200s last year. Okay. Well, uh, every month you, you post the outreach stuff that uh, I should go to, and there's one coming up this Saturday night after our board meeting. However, and uh, incidentally, he's married to another Pat, our merchandise manager, fun-loving lady named Pat McPartland. Here is Bruce Burdock, spam collector is his, <laughs> he collects spam, and he's married to Bonnie and longtime active member, also president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. Back with us, Tom Whittemore um, may be recovering or may check in late. You never know, a former Westmont guy. And we got silly stuff being sent to us. We laugh all the time with President Jerry's forwarded silly science cartoons. He's going to call some of them up right now. I hope I can jive here with, oh, okay, the guy sitting at his computer. And he <laughs> asked for some music from Alexis or uh, Siri. And he says, I don't want to play opera music. You can't make me. There you go. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> well, you know about AS, too. That's artificial stupidity. Did you guys get a big block over the second? The uh, right There you go. It's artificial intransigence. Oh, yeah, artificial intransigence. You know, I didn't even read that part. I just know uh, something called chat GBT, GPT. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Chat. Do you, do you talk to computers? Is that what it is? I know it writes essays. Anyway, call up another one, Jerry. Here's the robot, speaking of AI, sitting in front of a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a screen where you check in with, you you know, to make sure you are a human, prove that you're not a robot. And he says, oh, my God, that is so offensive. My God, yes. And there is the balloon from China delivering uh, some chow mein. <laughs> One of several. There's many, many. Oh, and the sun is playing with the planets. Uh, they're all jiving and dancing. You spin me around like a radio. Seriously, guys, says the sun. This song again, here comes the sun. I assume that's the Beatles version, right? Yeah. Do, do, and the sun goes, I'm going to kill you guys, all of you, in like a billion years if you don't stop that. Okay. I don't know where that comes. And here is books. <laughs> I like that one. Laid out, uh, geology books laid out like strata in the earth. <laughs> that looks like my bookshelves. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> We're getting rid of books at our library downtown. Ah, here we go. So until next week, adios, amibas. There he is with a cowboy hat. Not exactly 10 gallon, but 
It's almost like uh, Chuck's uh, sign off. And here's a couple of aliens way back at the beginning, 13.8 billion years ago, a few seconds before the creation of the universe. They're sitting at a giant computer or collider, say, hey, let's fire up this large Hadron particle collider and see what happens. Boom. Whoa, here we are. I? That's where it goes. There was a lot of concern, you know, when they did the uh, the one there in Switzerland that there we might, you know, we might burn the atmosphere. The whole bunch of, you know, horror stories that they set that off, but none of it happened. Yeah, and I thought of uh, what was that gentleman's name? Was that Claudio? Yes, Claudio was the man from CERN, and 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 I had a question for him. I never asked. They they take all the air out of those tubes, that big seventeen mile ring, don't they? They take the air out and. And it's the big, the big fiesta, or not fiesta, controversy that I heard was that people were afraid they were going to make a black hole and it would eat the Earth. Yeah. And when CERN heard that, they went ahead and did their experiments and didn't tell anyone. Uh, because they knew that wouldn't happen. It didn't suck up anything up? No. Right. Right. There was a great joke video on YouTube that showed the place, you know, gradually getting sucked into the interior right. of the Earth. I got to tell you, this has car- some very large valves on... Um, on CERN to uh, basically isolate the majority of the ring because it took them, when they first started, I forgot how many weeks it took them to pump that down. Mm. Well, it's, it's protons that they, they somehow keep in the middle of a vacuum. Did we lose uh, Snoopy? There he is on just oh, as we here. Coming in on the uh, balloon from China. After the turn of the century, the bloody red baron, that became me. There you go, China. No match for Snoopy, of course. You're going to have endless cartoons on that damn balloon from China. Yes, they are, and I only captured two of them. Seven miles that spread out, and here's a couple of cats. Can you enlarge that? They're looking at the carrier, and one says to the other, I go in, and when I come out, I'm in the vet uh, office, and then I go back in, and when I come out, I'm home, and the other says, suppose it could be a wormhole? <laughs> I like That's that. a repeat. Yep. Is it? Yeah, but it's a good one. And every every well, I try and filter out the repeats. <laughs> so I like this, I slip. Well, let's see. You got uh, everything covered there. Jelly beer, book, two cats, Chinese food delivery hunters waiting in the swamp. We didn't get that one, but maybe next week. What's that? He's, that was he's a shining recent a, one. Shining a flashlight into a frog's eyes, telling his partner, "That's how you do it." Oh next yeah. Week. Uh, that one, yeah, that one came after I sent everything out and I, I got all set up for this. Save it for next week. Yeah, it'll show up next week. I, like I said Friday night, gentlemen, after you introduced me, Mr. Prez, uh, this program we do, SBAU Astro Hour, to me is like a uh, tuition-free astronomy course at a university. I'm hoping all of us learn something and people that watch. We got about 100 or so that at some point watch us. And how far away are things to follow your talking points consecutively? Parallax, RR Lyrae stars, Cepheid variables, and type 1A supernovae. Let's um, do the parallax, which is the same thing as stereoscopically in a way, isn't it? Two yes, ideas. it's where we get our, our stereo vision. Yeah. It's how we determine things on the human scale. But it works up to um, stars that are in, near us. Right. Um, the uh, there's an interesting book called Parallax, yes. which discusses the history of people trying to determine the distance to stars they see by measuring parallax. It turns out it was way harder to do than anyone appreciated because the stars are much farther away than they knew. But they, I don't think they got it till around the 1800s, 1838 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. They finally saw it. And uh, a distance measurement is based on that because a, a parallax measurement of one arc second is called a parsec, par for parallax and second for second. So a parsec, which is around three light years, uh, as, re- as I recall. 3.25, right? Or 2.6. 3.26 light years. Okay. Close enough. This illustrates the topic of parallax, which um, I don't think needs much explanation. We're all very familiar with it. So, uh, how many stars do you suppose we've distanced with that method? Just 
handful thousands thousands yeah it was especially uh, with Hipparcos. that was a satellite that went up there and was dedicated to parallax and now you've yeah. got gaia so they're doing two billion stars yes really so it would work out to several thousand light years um yeah Not sure well it maybe it doesn't reach a point where it doesn't you, they can't be that far apart no matter where we are in the orbit hmm. okay. well this is this is the baseline this is the sun this is the earth this is the earth six months later so if you measure the position of a star in the a target star in the sky, it might be in the Big Dipper on one side of our orbit and outside the Big Dipper in the other side of the orbit. And so this is the baseline. This is the equivalent of the distance between your two eyes when we do it uh, for objects like a glass of beer on the countertop. So, <laughs> Wow. So that's 93 million times two apart. That would be about yeah. 180 something thousand. 186. 186 million. million. So, okay. Parallax. There was also a Warren Beatty movie called Parallax View. It was a thriller. Yes. Anybody know what, what it was about? It was about an assassination plot. Right. That involved what we're talking about using. No, Parallax? not at all. Not at all. All right. Screw it. Yes, there's no science in that, just ballistics. <laughs> Sounds so good. Once you get past the mechanical aspects of it, people used to claim that we'll never know anything about the stars because all we do, all we can do, we can't go there. We can just see their light. That was shortly before spectra were discovered. And of course, you can, in spectra, you can measure um, uh, uh, chemical components. You can also do redshift and get velocities and that sort of stuff. Yeah, we'll get to that. The first of all, there's a number of standard candles based on just the brightness of stars. Standard candles. Yeah, standard candle. There is, um, as we've discussed before, there are Cephid variables. Uh huh. And they have what's called a luminosity um, period relationship. So if you measure the period of the oscillations of the variable star, you immediately know how bright it is at the star. And then you can uh, measure how bright it is here at Earth, and you get the, the one over R squared relationship of dimming of distant stars gives you the distance to the star. And that one's good for, um, that one's good up to um, other galaxies. You did give us a formula, little m minus big M equals five log D minus five. Yeah, I wasn't going to go into formulas on the show. That's just for your background. But yeah, it shows the um, distance relationship. It shows it in a log form for the magnitude. But um, the um, Cephid variables and RR Lyra stars both have this type of relationship. The RR Lyra stars... Um, are very well for globular clusters, which are outside the galaxy, but around the galaxy, and for our galactic halo. The Cephid variables um, were famously used by Hubble to uh, measure the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and put it definitely outside of our galaxy. And that was that resolved the conflict of the early 20th century, our, our spiral galaxies of spiral galaxies in our galaxy or the other galaxies outside and that resolved that huh. there's also um a type 1a supernova and while type 1a supernovas we don't know exactly their brightness just from brightness but with, they do have a characteristic decay to them when you catch the thing if you catch it early at the peak and then the shape of the curve when it goes down can be used to estimate distances and that's used for things where you really can't see the galaxy well you see the supernova but you can also see the supernova in some galaxies well uh, the, the, there's something uh confusing about that term in your uh, notes mr president uh it says either capital i or the number one dash a and i couldn't tell which is that i a or is that one a it's, it's one a but it's roman numerals oh is that what it is yeah okay so it is ia yeah 
I'll be damned. Well, there's not a two or three A. Yes, super there are. There oh, are. There are. There are type two supernovae. Well, well what is what's different? Is it possible in type wouldn't... type one is is uh, white dwarfs reaching a certain limit to their mass and exploding, and type two is core collapse supernovae and massive stars. Okay. Type two is not a useful standard candle. What isn't? It's type two. Oh. Okay, but we have to catch something blowing up but to get the distance. Is that the gist of yeah. type 1A supernovae? Mm -hmm. We have to catch it blowing up. Yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't happen that often. Oh, it happens. You can find hundreds of them every night if you have a big enough telescope. In different galaxies. Yes. Yeah. But not here. And sometimes galaxy. there have been several galaxies um, where... Uh, supernovas have recurred but if we get one here we'll see it won't we uh with that with naked eye i'm sure it'll depends where it is in the galaxy oh something i wanted to know maybe i'll just slip it in right now does our sun have a magnitude num number a designation yes. yeah might it be minus five thousand or something minus 22 minus 22 Bright as it is, okay. Every magnitude is a uh, two and a half times in brightness. Oh, so it builds up quicker than you might. Every think. every step in five is a hundredfold increase. So it's it's a logarithmic scale. Yeah, just, just like, like the, the earthquake region. scale, similar. Yeah, okay, got you. I just knew that. And only scale decibels. Uh huh. And a bad one. It's in more Turkey. Ron's bailiwick. <laughs> <laughs> Standard candles. I love it. Okay. So, the, well, we're up down to the redshift. And how big is a bar, parsec? How many? 3.26 light years. Oh, light years. Three point. Hmm. It just builds it up by three, actually. That's And the Lyrae the Lyrae stars, we learned, where, where are we now? Is this a spectrometer or spectroscopy or a spectroscope? Or this is the cool. this is a spectrum of hydrogen. The, ah. There are there are these. This is a series of of spectral emission lines or absorption lines in hydrogen, and this series is called the Lyman series. The one in the visible um, is called one farther out to the right. It's called the Balmer series. And then to the left, there's another one, the Pashan series. But the Lyman series is the one that's useful for distance measure in the um, uh, sky. With redshift, these lines will shift. Infrared is that way, off to the right. The wavelength gets longer. This is 1,250 angstrom units which is not really used anymore, but it's the one that was used commonly when I was a kid, so I'm calibrated in angstroms. The green line of um, in the middle of our spectrum is 5,550 angstroms. So the visible is, this is in the ultraviolet, and when it redshifts, it's going to shift into the visible. Now, what happens for um, galaxies, we can measure the, the emission lines of galaxies and the redshift will shift them to the infrared. Excuse me. And uh, the, uh, we can measure that directly, but there are dark things in the middle. As a matter of fact, the missing mass um, or the, the, the baryonic mass in the universe is about 5% of the mass in the universe. The other mass that's missing being um, dark matter, which we don't know anything about, but except that it's there. Um, but there, we can only, for a while, we could only account for half of the uh, baryonic mass when we added up all the mass. So it was speculated that the dust and dark matter between the galaxies, very tenuous, was the other five, the other half of the 5% of baryonic matter. And it turns out that is correct. And the way it was discovered is that when you have a dark gas cloud and you have a bright light source behind it, such as a, a quasar, you can, or a pulsar, anything you have behind it as a bright light source, 
when the light goes through the dark cloud, the hydrogen in it absorbs the light. And so you get these lines that show up as um, absorption lines. And at the distance they are from you, they, they redshift by their distance, just like galaxies do. And so you can tell um, how far away the cloud is. Now, this is... Got to be a distant quasar, and it's coming through multiple gas clouds. Right. And so you get a series of these Lyman alpha lines, this line. You get a series of them. One, one would be, well, they're redshifted. So this is the farthest to the left this would be. There would be another one, say, out here for a close dark nebula, and a whole bunch of lines going at, back in, in distant, going out in distance for it. And so you can measure for each of these gas clouds um, where, where they are and what how much absorption there is. So that gives you how much mass there is. And they added that up, and that came to the other half. So all the baryonic matter in our universe, the total 5% is accounted for. That's the definition of baryonic? Baryonic is what we consider to be normal matter. It's the stuff we can see. It has a charge. It interacts with light. Okay. So your initial statement, Mr. President, that the farther away this hydrogen is, the better we're going to see it because it goes into the visible uh, infrared spectrum and we can see the hydrogen in a distant galaxy, but not close up, closer. Well, to no, we, we build our instruments so that they can see to where the zero redshift Lyman line is and then beyond that. And so you see them stack up as you get farther and farther away. So that's the final um, candle, standard candle. And that, that is the uh, arrows in our quiver for how we get distance measurements in the sky. Are we talking about the hydrogen that's inside distant stars that are fusing them? Uh, the hydrogen, hydrogen was created uh, in the Big Bang. Um, and a little helium and a teeny bit of lithium, and that was pretty much it. So this is all primordial hydrogen that we're looking at, and it's not in stars, it's in space between stars. Right, it's just clouds of, of hydrogen not ionized, or ionized very little. Yeah. We can't look at a star's hydrogen that's being fused because it's, what, too violent or? Well, it's already, it's, it's, an, it's already a plasma. Oh, oh, I see. But it's, all the these lines of, uh, it's the most dominant element in the universe. In the universe, yeah. sure it about, is. About half of all the hydrogen is um, not in a structure. It's just in the space between everything, and the rest of it is all in structures: stars, galaxies. But I've heard uh, every cubic meter has what two or three atoms, <laughs> somewhere like that. It's very tenuous between the galaxies, but there is a lot of space. There is a very much larger, larger space. The thing that I've never understood, Mr. President, and the rest of you, is the difference between gas, which I can understand being out there, and dust, which to me connotes little solid particles. How the hell did we get little solid particles? Did Breezed off of stars. Okay, so that would be the leftover refuse or debris from a blown up star that we're talking yes. about. Or, or, or just in the wind from like a red giant. That's yeah. their surfaces are cool enough, like carbon stars that you can get carbon soot. Yeah. Oh, there's no, there's no hydrogen dust. Yeah. I know, but uh, carbon stars, uh, still carbon is just an atom. Does it yeah. belch out or throw out little particles, little pieces? That when, they, when things blow up, they make a lot of molecules. Um, and they um, have pressure waves that go through. Uh, when these molecule, molecular clouds collapse into a planet, they start forming minerals. And oh. then it, there's, there's a collision and they get blown apart. You suppose, you suppose inside the stars there are compounds of molecules like salt and... No, not, not, not inside of stars, but in their upper atmospheres of cool stars, you can get like carbon soot and then you know, you'll blow off some other atoms too. And then once they're away from the star, they can combine. Oh, and then the uh, end result is what we've got here in the solar system. Everything's on this planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as I'm sure you know, the moon is covered with dust. Yeah. 
Well, that's because of the collisions, the constant bombardment, Bingo. right? Bingo. Yeah. And that's where <laughs> dust comes from. <clears throat> yes, a Europa just absorbs all those crashing meteors and refreezes re over and the damn rock floats down, you suppose? <laughs> right. Well, Jupiter did the same thing when Schumacher Levy hit it. That's you true. Know, you had that black, Jupiter. You had black spots, but they filled in. Okay, what is this? Okay, this is how you make a kilonova. Ah, it's a kilonova. I've always wanted a process. To. This is a process. We start at one, and the various stages are all the way around here to nine. This is the final kilonova. Uh. So. Chuck, do you want to go through this process? All yours. You, well, you know, you basically have a symbiotic system there where you have stars that are passing mass back and forth. Binaries that are too yeah. close. It's a binary. Start with a binary. Binary is close. Um, here's they're exchanging gas from the larger one to the smaller, more dense one. This one um, has a, sort of an eruption. And, and becomes a neutron star. Right. And then the, the dust col collapses on it to where it, it becomes a nova. And so you get another neutron star. Right. You get two neutron stars now. So the, the first star over here is this star here, the neutron star. And this becomes this. And then this becomes a nova. And this, this star here is there. And then you get two neutron stars. And then the neutron stars combine and they produce this kilonova. And the end result of the kilonova seems to be a black hole, but maybe another bigger neutron star. But in going through this process, it loses a lot of its mass, getting blown away. It... Some gets blown away, but a lot of it goes into the. Uh, into the density of the neutron star. And then when they collide, that's when you get the really, really heavy elements made. And they're called neutron stars because the protons and electrons are forced together? Yes. Yep. And the neutrons are forced together, but they just be, they become close-packed neutrons. How is that different from a white dwarf? That's close-packed electrons, more or less. Just electrons? <laughs> well, no, it's there's other stuff in there. Yeah. Okay. But it's if electron you... degeneracy pressure holding them up. Whereas with a neutron star, it's the neutron degen, you know, neutron poly exclusion principle. So would it be fair to say that a neutron star probably doesn't have any field force of magnetism? No, no the, a magnetar is a really strongly magnetized neutron star. Oh, okay, so a bit heavier on pro on on positive or negative, more protons or more electrons, depending. Probably electrons, I think. The four forces, uh, the electromagnetic is the strongest, even stronger than the gravity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Gravity is gravity, the, the weakest, a factor of 10 to the 40. Was oh, that right? Yeah. There's two in the side of the atom, and one of them is called the weak. Yep, and the other is the strong. And it has to do with throwing out particles. I don't understand that, but that's all right. That's why I take this course, gentlemen. So that's well, a kilonova as opposed to a supernova or a, kil or a hypernova. Well, the, the two, you know, where you see the red star blow up type effect there, those are supernovas there. Okay. That's here and here. It, does science know how close they got to be to go, go through this process? How, how many light months or weeks are they apart, you suppose? Well, they spiral inward, so that all changes over time. That's why the sort of one, two, and three going on up there. But we got a lot of stars up there that are binaries, but, and yeah. they're not going to do this anytime soon, so how far apart well, are those? Some of them we see as one star, don't we? It depends on their masses, but they will do this. Or they will do this, like and, that, and if one you know, they're constantly radiating away energy by gravitational waves if they're orbiting each other, and so you're you're going to get them over long periods of time getting closer together. So, is a kilonova as as spectacular as a other kind of a nova? No, no, it's less, it's less energetic. 
would have to be pretty close to us to stun us and get us excited. <laughs> it depends. If that's your field of study, you get pretty excited, no matter how far away they are. Kilonovas. Sounds metric. Well, that's what it is. It's, it's between us, a nova and a supernova, so they called it a kilonova. Yeah, I wouldn't okay. take it literally. Okay, now the full moon happened yesterday, yep. and this is the snow moon. This is the picture I captured off the internet of a bird, uh, and I guess this is taken in England. It might even have been the APOD that day, <laughs> but um, the idea is it's it's a super moon. No, it's a mini moon. Yeah. It's a mini moon. Excuse me. Yeah, actually going back and back and forth on these sides. Um, actually, that this this oh, micro moon, was yeah. the micro moon. Oh, it's further so, out. Yes, it's further out. And so the moon as seen from the Earth, when it's at perigee, it's a super moon. Uh, when it occurs at, this would be um, yeah. a apogee. quarter moon, but it's representative of half of the full moon. And this is the apogee. This is the, the actual distance or actual change in size. It appears 14% bigger when it's a super moon and 30% brighter because of that. So what... And that when this happens at full moon, then it's, it has one of these names, micro moon or super moon. And this is what we discussed I think, last time about when uh, it occurs at new moon, you can get solar eclipses that are annular or total. Well, now, whether it was an apogee or perigee, if it happened in the month of February, it, it's always going to be a snow moon, right? It has nothing to do with its size. That's correct. Um, these moons, depending on where you're from and what culture you're in, um, there's no set name for the moons. This is just what um, they're generally called, according to Wikipedia. Yeah, well, they didn't name it here because we never have snow. <laughs> well, we used to have, I, my wife lived a while in Ohio, and so she's not a real big fan of snow and ice. But I was raised here in Southern California, and I always paid a lot of money to go to snow and ice and had fun <laughs> skiing. So I don't have that fear of it. I think it's pretty cool if you have a season with snow in it. We We've had snow in our mountains. Here? Yeah, we have. I paid a lot of money to go to it and drive up the hill and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's but it never came to me. <laughs> yeah, but we it don't did have snow a in Santa Barbara here. in the late '40s at some point. Yes, 1949. Okay, I remember it. I was in LA and it snowed. Yeah, I grew up in the Bay Area and San Francisco had snow uh, several times. Yeah, this year. Oh, yeah. really? Okay. I'll be damned. So well, basically, the snow moon this month is at apogee. Got it. Got it. But the, it's it's this the new moon in February is called the snow moon. It's not because it's at apogee. Yeah. Okay. It's just it, real small now. It's a micro moon too. You, you know what next month's going to be called? I I do not. I'd have to look it up. Is that spring, worm moon? Spring moon maybe. Worm moon, I think, because yeah, the worm I think worm moon come comes up. along sometime in the spring, right? Yeah. Worm, as in worm, yeah, yeah, worm, as in worm. earthworm. <laughs> okay. Far, most of these moons come from farming. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right, we're up in the sky. Okay, this is the evening sky with Orion and Gemini and Taurus, with Mars. Easiest to spot these things. Um, these are bright stars: Betelgeuse, Pollux, Aldebaran. Aldebaran and Betelgeuse are, are red stars, red giants. But it's also a very rich uh, hunting ground for deep, faint fuzzies. This is the Milky Way going through here. It's not the center of our galaxy Milky Way. It's the rim, the outward rim from our point of view. The um, In a lot of science fiction books, it's called the, the rim worlds are out here. So... There are, um, highlighted in this one, is NGC 2392, which is a planetary nebula. And this is that nebula. Planetary now, planetary nebula. nebula is not a nova. This is just where the uh, star burped off its outer layers. Hmm. 
Yeah, that also one used to be called the Eskimo. Yes. Looks yeah. like an igloo. Yeah, it looks like a well, the big fur around the face. Oh, oh gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And now it's now it's now it's uh you know called the clown face. I don't think well, anybody does call Eskimo. it that, but that's what they want you to call it these days because Eskimo Nebula was apparently offensive to the Inuits. Yeah, but I don't like clowns. Yeah. <laughs> But this is not one star exploding, it's a whole nebula, which is many. Well, it's one star and it's burped off a nebula around it. Nebula just means cloud. Oh, okay, gotcha. The star oh. is probably right in the middle of the clown's nose. Yeah. Yeah, this is the star right there. Yeah. And, and this is the guy white dwarf. Wow. Looks like a Disney cartoon. <laughs> All right. We also have two other very famous pictures. You've seen these a lot. NGC 2264, 2261, and 2244. And these are in that order. This is the Christmas tree nebula, 2261, I think. Let me see. It's the top one. 2264. And the next one is 2261. This is the cone nebula down here. That's easy to spot. Yep. Why is there a slice in that? Do you know? Does science know? Yes. Could be called the slice of pie nebula. That's just a dark foreground nebula that's not fluorescing. Right. Oh, it's not something blocking. It's backlit. It's like the horsehead nebula in Orion. It's backlit by uh, emitting hydrogen. And this red is the hydrogen alpha light, the bright line of hydrogen, ionized hydrogen. It's not red-shifted hydrogen. No. no. Okay. Matter of fact, redshift doesn't count in the local group or in our galaxy. Everything is all sorts of color shifted. Huh. This is NGC 2261, the famous variable nebula. And why is this, that? Why is it variable? Um, because there are clouds. It's passing, the star is passing that illuminates the nebula. There's a lot of dust around here that's dark, and when some of that dust gets in the way, the nebula changes its total brightness. Mm. Here we have NGC 2244, and that refers not to the red nebula. The red nebula is very prominent, but here it's subdued because the NGC number applies to the open cluster, star cluster that's around here, These this knot of stars. And these stars are um, have formed from this nebula cloud. Uh, other stars are forming, and there's cavities in this star in this nebula where the stars have blown the nebula away. There's a lot of structure in this. It's an easy target for astrophotographers to to catch. It's very dramatic, and it's right here, just down from Orion. Go out there, the same distance. To Betelgeuse and down a little bit, sort of like up there and down, and you come to that nebula. It's not the, the red spot is the nebula. The, the white dot here is the star cluster, NGC 2244. This is a very nice set of objects uh, for outreach this time of year. Nebulas are us. <laughs> <laughs> and they're they're all spawning grounds for stars. Well, not all. The ones around uh, planetary planetaries like the Eskimo, there's not enough <laughs> to make a star usually, mm -hmm. and it's spread really? out. So they're just spreading stuff back out into the universe. And most of it is debris from blown up stars. It's not the original hydrogen. No, a lot of it's primordial hydrogen, but there's some mm -hmm. from stars from previous yeah. generations. That's why you have soot and dust. But, but the, the percentage of heavier elements, or as astronomers call it, metals, uh, is increasing every time you get something burping or blowing up. Yeah. So you'd, you'd see more of those heavier elements in a planetary nebula than you would in, in one of these other hydrogen nebulae. Okay, but the, the heavier elements weren't around at the beginning. Right. After the Big Bang, it was all hydrogen. And somehow that was dinky hydrogen, little Hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium and beryllium, and that's it. You mean uh, helium didn't get fused? It just got created by the Big Bang like hydrogen yes. did? Yes. 
Well, some of it got fused because that's where helium came from. And well, heli helium was also created in the Big Bang. Right. And that's some lithium right. and some beryllium. Right. So that that's the product of fusion. Lithium it three. Happened very, it happened very quickly. It's not like our sun burning hydrogen in a continual process until it runs out. Because the, the expansion was so quick, all the stuff came apart before it could sustain hydrogen or hydrogen fusion. Mm -hmm. Well, just about all the stars in our galaxy or in any galaxy are going through the list of the, the elements, right? Uh, where do you suppose our sun is? Up to carbon, up to oxygen? Or is it still in the hydrogen? No, it's, the just, helium? it's using hydrogen to form helium. It's on the main sequence. Yeah. In other words, it it's a long way from iron when it's yes. going to cease to exist. Yes, and but that, it's at least a second or third generation star. So there are those other elements in there, but they're in low proportions and we're not making them. Got it. That's fascinating stuff, gentlemen. Okay. Okay, this is the next, this is a uh, constellation that was highlighted by Astronomy Magazine, the constellation of Draco. And this yeah. is an insane time to do it because it's low and it's behind our mountains. Why do they do that? I don't know. I was just going to point that out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they have a penchant for showing things, you know, like, oh, there it goes. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it is quite a nice constellation. It's long. It, this is up. This is Ursa Minor. So it's up near the North Pole. Polaris is up off the charts here. So depending on your horizon, um, not for us here with the mountains, the San Inez Mountains, but um, it is something that is sort of up all year. Uh, Ursa Minor is all year. The um, It's just right now it's way below the Polaris. The, cons the uh, comet E3 went down here, or excuse me, went up this way um, and is out of this area now. It but was right next to Capella last night. Oh, okay. And Did I cranked the melon cam on it to kind of prepare for Saturday for the star party at the museum to see how much green it was going to show because it's been hyped up as the Emerald Comet. Yeah. There's not a lot of green showing, no, at least not in the melon cam. What, what exposure times did you use? I used up to 56 seconds. And when I did 56 okay. seconds, you could see a little green. But anything yeah. shorter than that, it was very hard to detect any green. Yeah, I didn't get very much green at all at 30 seconds. OK. What constellation oh. is the Capello in? Auriga, the charioteer. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. But uh, Ursa Minor is the Little Dipper? Yeah, yeah the Little Dipper sticking down here. And and by me, by um, Saturday, for the star party, the comet's going to be up by Mars. Yeah. Oh, it so is good. They're not going to occult, are they? It, no. it is fading. Yeah. Oh. Now, That's this, good. my final point of this is that, um, by the way, there's a visible um, double star there, Mysore and Alcor. But um, this is looking out away from the, in contrast to the previous slide, where we were looking with the band of the Milky Way going through here, and it was a target-rich uh, background. Draco is not like that. Draco is looking out. There are galaxies around here. This is looking out of the North Pole of the, um, not of, of the Earth, but also of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. So you don't see any Milky Way going through this part of the sky. Huh. But the stars you showed earlier in the hour, Jerry, that are always in front of the Milky Way will never, they don't have a season in that. They don't relocate, do they? They're always planted against that filmy white well, Milky Way. <laughs> yeah, there's unless they have a real big parallax, you're not going to see any motion to them. Got or it. a real big proper motion. Right. <laughs> real <right>. big. <laughs> there's a couple stars that have big proper motions, but not real big. Yeah. So anyway, this is a lineup of planets in the morning and the uh, excuse me. Yeah, on the evening sky. Jupiter to the Neptune. east of Neptune, Neptune. Venus. So we have it's not like the lineup where we had virtually all the planets earlier in the year. Here we have Venus, Neptune and Jupiter and you won't see Neptune visually. You need a telescope to see that. It's about oh about 10th magnitude. Yeah, I think nine or eight or nine. Yeah, okay. Right now. 
All right. Would it be so fair to say, a, gentlemen, that is, Venus will always be near the sun when it sets right. or before it rises? And but that's why this that's why the sky is so bright here. Right. But the okay, but the other planets to be seen near Venus would have to be on the other side of the sun, wouldn't they? Pretty much. They're not on this yeah. side or they wouldn't be close to the sun. They'd yep. be behind us. Your Jupiter and Neptune. Yes, that's true. Okay. And we have the dreaded retrograde. Oh, here's our favorite map. You want to enlarge that? There we go. Yeah, but this is just this is just to get uh, Chuck's attention. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, this is the chart that I want to show. Yeah. That's the balloon being brought down, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Good. No. Not um, exactly. Looks sort of like that, or some minor. So I took a picture about here. Um, and uh, right now we are, what is this, the sixth? So it should be right about here. And on the weekend, what is the date on the weekend? The 12th? The 11th. 11th. Okay. For Saturday. Yeah, this is our Saturday night star party at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. So it's very close to Mars. Okay, the earthquake we're having here is the cleaning lady. <laughs> so so it's heading down toward the horizon and will disappear. No, in a no Ron, this, this, look, take a look. Polaris and, and Ursa Minor are hanging so that the bowl of the Little Dipper is very near the horizon. So if you flip this around, it's more like right. what it's doing. It's getting higher in the sky. Okay. There, there we go. go. That's how it really is. <laughs> <Ta -da. laughs> All right. Yeah, and that, actually the top of the sky, the zenith, is about here. Because in Mars, you're back on the ecliptic, which is below the zenith. Or is it? No, Mars is kind of on the zenith right now. It's, it's fairly high. Yeah, it's fairly high. Yeah, so this is going up, 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 and far, farther over here to go down. It's going to become a southern um, southern hemisphere object here in another couple of weeks. Well, you would what, think something that has a 50,000-year orbit would be in the sky at least a year or two with us. It was. You just couldn't see it. It was so far away. Yeah, they discovered it in March of 2022, so it's already coming on a year. Is it? Yeah. Okay. But most uh, most of your comets, your Halley's were 70 something years or under 100. Well, those are periodic comets. This is not a periodic comet. Well, In the sense period. that we call periodic comets ones that are like 200 years. Okay, but to be a comet, it has to come from either Kuiper or Oort cloud, right? No, it just has to have a lot of ice. Yeah. Oh. It has to have something to boil off to make a tail. So they could come inward from the Trojans of Jupiter's orbit or? Or, or from the, the asteroid belt. Yeah, it just depends if they have ice in them or not. If, if Oumuamua had an ice on it, the ice on it, it would have been a comet from interstellar space. They want it to come back so bad. <laughs> it ain't gonna. <laughs> there was some talk about trying to chase it down. Ooh. But I haven't, I've been following plans and um, funding and there's no no plans in operation that I know of to do that it's not going to be they're going to try to uh, intercept the next one yeah yeah because this is not a unique event well it's not going out to where Voyager one or Voyager two is by any chance is it close enough <laughs> <laughs> no well, probably well, not. it's going out it's going to leave our solar system just like one and two are and and why do why do the Hawaiians get to name something? It was a Hawaiian ast, uh, astronomy guy, wasn't it, that found it? That's the reason. I right, it was a Hawaiian observatory. Yeah, yeah. Okay. got it. Umua, umua. <laughs> I don't think any one person is responsible for these names. They set up guidelines and rules, and then they agree on selecting names from a certain pot. Isn't that a little truck-sized asteroid that passed the Earth last week? Wasn't that found by one amateur? I don't think so. That's what I think I heard. It okay. passed the 2,200 miles altitude. Jeez. And, small, uh, small asteroids are really tough for amateurs to find yeah. relative to the big survey scopes. But that one we could have survived if it hit the atmosphere. It'd just oh, be yeah. a big light show, wouldn't it? Well. 
I'm guessing it was about the size of Chelyabinsk. <laughs> yeah. Listen, gentlemen, I don't know if you're fans of Nova on PBS, but next Sunday night they're going to do Astronomy in Africa. It's called Star Chasing in Senegal. Huh. 10 o'clock on Sunday night, PBS. Is that going to be history of astronomy, do you know, or is it current astronomy going on? It's, on it's, very it's dark current. It's, okay. it's current, but I love that history on Friday night from our man, yeah. uh, Dr. Bassey. Is, is to it going to be... Um, Amateur astronomy or is it professional observatories? I, it appeared to be, oh no, it's, they're setting up, it's guys like us, or okay. you guys anyway, with small, yeah, I don't, they're my, I don't know. I just saw a quick promo on it. I know a lot of European amateurs that are really serious astrophotographers have remote observatories that they've set up in Africa. I imagine yeah. Yeah. Australia. Yeah. But, Bruce is on the phone. That's he's being evicted from his house or something. What do we got going here? Okay. Ah, there we are. Okay. Love this these. is um, here's Mars up here, Taurus, Perseus. The object here is the opportunity to view M34, which is a very nice. Um, open cluster. We looked at this about a week ago when I visited Gary up at Napomo. He was showing me his unistellar scope and we looked at that through it. It was very, very nice. It does a very good job of these things. It would be a good outreach scope, I think. Perseus, so, was, Perseus, Perseus. was the hero. Yes. yes. This doesn't look very much like him. But <laughs> by the way, in your talking points, you labeled the picture M35. That's the one in oh. Uh, Gemini. Oh, dang. But it's magnitude five and a half, five degrees west, northwest. Star. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, this, this image breaks up if I go too big. But okay. this is a very nice. These stars really stand out. They're very spectacular stars against a very dark background. It's a nice little open cluster. It's got this little tail of stars that comes down here like... Um, Allie's braid. Like the Ple Pleiades. Yeah. Yeah. I love saying some of these names. Algol, Mirfak. <laughs> Algol is the one that changes brightness on about a three-day schedule. And it's the eye of the Medusa monster winking back at the Earth. It comes from Ras al Ghul, the head of the demon. That makes it a variable? It's a variable. But not a Cepheid variable. No, it's a naked eye variable. It's an eclipsing binary or eclipsing multiple star system. Okay. It's actually a triple, but... Algol's companion star occasionally blocks its brightness. That's yeah. why. Goes around each other and eclipses or occults. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Spectacular open star. So it's M34. Now, what's 35? M35 35 is the one we looked at last week. That's the one near yeah. the feet of Gemini. Oh, okay. Not on this image. No. And what would the constellation Perseus look like? Is it a warrior? Yeah, and he's got a sword, and he's uh, holding the head of the Medusa monster. Oh, good lord. Why don't I? Well, uh, 88. Apparently he's trying to turn the uh, Pleiades to stone, if this is the head he's holding out there. Well, the head's down a little bit more, and it was towards Cetus the sea monster. Down here. Yeah. So his you foot is over you... by the Pleiades. Yes. Is uh, Atik is after? like his ankle. Uh-huh. You mean Achilles? Is that what you're talking about, ankle? No, uh, Atik no. is the star that's at his at his ankle. It's just to the right of the Pleiades in this image. We don't have an Achilles constellation, do we? That'd no. be interesting. But uh, fascinating stuff. I'll go M34. It's an open star cluster. It's got it. Boy, we got a lot of clusters going. I wonder how many youngsters know about clusters there is the reason we're looking at clusters right now is because the moon just passed full 
And so faint fuzzies are hard to see at this time, but open clusters uh, are very little affected by uh, moonlight, bright moon. Means that they're mostly Here's, stars, not dust. Yeah. Yeah. And the globular clusters are summertime things. So it's open clusters in the wintertime. Yep. And how many different moon. how many different types are there? Open, star, closed, closed a closed <laughs> cluster? What the so hell there's is open that? and globular pretty much. Oh, yeah. Oh, You'll okay. hear opens in older literature called galactic clusters too. Whereas nebulas are just big patches of dust and gas. It just means cloud, yeah. 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 Clouds, all right. So here's Mars and the Pleiades up here, and here's M35 in Gemini. And that's the soccer ball they're kicking. Right. See the foot. Now the Pleiades, are they a cluster? Yes. Yes. Called the Pleiades. It's not, it's not an M number. M45. It's M45, it's M45 right, there. right there. And every one of those names is a star that we've named and can see in that. Yes. Yeah, Electra, Alcyon, Atlas, Pleione, Mariope, Mer Merope. I'm not going to do Maya. Maya. Maya, okay. Saliano or Salino. Well, Stero, and Tigata. Tigata, yeah. It's, it's been my misapprehension to see that over my life and think that was the Little Dipper, I think. It's like five stars with a small handle. It's it a micro look dipper. Like a little dipper, but it's a micro dipper. Ah, okay, that's what it is. <laughs> Interesting. The best description I've heard for um, Perseus, which was in the previous slide there, is uh, a lawn chair. A lawn chair. <laughs> yeah. For what it's shaped like. The well, trouble is, this planetarium. Um, Software adds all sorts of lines that are not the traditional way that I see, used to see yeah. things. So I'm sure there's a launch chair in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but for example, it irritates me every time I see Cassiopeia this way. I'm just used to this, 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 and that for a W or an M. Yeah. So this line there and this line there are distractions. Distractions. Hmm. Yeah, they're they're dimmer than what I see. I look for certain constellations or landmarks for me when I'm pointing my telescope, and I don't see these these stars. They're there and they're there with my old eyes. Yeah, usually you just see the W or the M. Right. <coughs> now these constellations that are up there named after people are the people myths that didn't exist. Cassiopeia was she a real queen or not? No, that's all Perseus. mythical stuff. Yeah, it's all mythical. Okay, so there was no Perseus. No, was like uh, who was the guy in Helen of Troy that saved Helen? Paris was that his name? Paris, yeah, Paris. Well, he abducted Helen. Yeah, uh, did he exist? Probably not. That's that's been a long standing argument whether the city of Troy even existed and whether the Trojan War was a real thing or not. Uh, but whether Brad friend. Pitt, whether Brad Pitt was in the war or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rick Steve sometimes takes us to Europe and they went to Rhodes, and I kept thinking of the Colossus, which I guess nobody's ever drawn a picture of it. Obviously, we don't have a photograph of the there, Colossus. There are pictures of it, yeah, but nobody's found the ruins of it it was as big as the uh, statue of liberty but its legs were spread apart on the uh, over the entrance of the harbor and mm. that's the way it's been imagined that there there is somewhere in the ancient world there was a big statue that was real because um the fingers of the of a hand that big uh, have been discovered oh that's <laughs> carved out of marble or something so well, it's we don't take on astrology, but we'll take mythology and know all that. And I learned Friday night from our guest speaker that <clears throat> Galileo got blind by looking through a telescope at the sun. I had no idea, <laughs> but at least he didn't get burned at the stake, did he? No, no. <laughs> 
Well, look, we're going to gather again next week, gentlemen. I tell you, we're going to have some fun. And, uh, oh, Saturday is between now and then. We're going to have a meeting, and that'll be uh, online, and then we'll gather together. You say 2,500 people went into the free day at the zoo, uh, Chuck? At the museum, yeah. yes. The museum. <laughs> it's the zoo when we're there. Yeah. Uh, but last month, what was it like on the Saturday Star Party? Did we have a good crowd turn up in the dark? Wasn't it rained out? It might have been, you know. I think it was, in. yeah. So this will be our first one in probably a couple of months, easily. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, seven o'clock, six o'clock. And actually, I think there's rain forecast for that. Weekend. Yeah, there's a chance of rain. Star party's supposed to start at seven, but there's a chance of rain. We'll see how that develops, whether we cancel or not. You have an yeah. outreach this week between now and then. Yeah, we have a couple. Um, we have uh, Monte Vista School and San Inez Elementary School. Okay. Yes. Not nuts, night under the stars. How do people find out about that? Just go sbau.org? Well, the school events are not really public. So yeah, but sbau.org has our events. Okay, gentlemen, uh, Bruce, nice I'm to here. have you back. You missed some exciting yeah. stuff, but we'll see you guys maybe with Tom Whittemore on board next Monday and take care of your wives and yourselves and keep the vaccinations coming. And gentlemen, thank you very much. I learned a lot. We'll do it again. The SBAU Astro Hour, number 103 next week. Good afternoon. Uh, See you all later. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.